Welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins. Hey everyone, I'm here with Brock Kaufman. He is the founder of Post Exit Founders. It's one of the fastest growing communities inside the United States and also internationally for people who have sold their business and they're trying to figure out what comes next. And so we're going to be talking about what are those three different categories of Post Exit Founders. We're going to be talking about a soccer team that Brock invested in that is moving up the ranks and competing with Wrexham and Ryan Reynolds. We'll be talking about the idea maze and quite a few other topics. So Brock, it's good to have you. Thanks for having me, Connor. Brock, I would love to hear a little bit around your journey and that transition to you starting your first company at, at Intello and, and eventually selling it to SailPoint. I started my career at Insight Partners on the investment team there. They're one of the largest, if not the largest, software investment firm in the world. And I spent three years there and doing everything from high growth, early stage software investing to late stage buyouts and roll ups of different companies. I decided to leave to start a software company. Insight is a great place. I learned a ton. There was a path. A lot of my closest friends and started being Insight are now partners there. But I had this idea I just couldn't shake. And that's what became Intello. We were SaaS to manage all the SaaS for businesses. At first, we were really focused on how to optimize the software spend for all the unused software subscriptions and licenses that the companies had. Honestly, and we, we can talk about this, but from uh, we started the company in early 2017 and companies just didn't care as much about saving money as, as they have over the last couple of years since the, since the market turned. And, uh, and we kind of got pulled by our customers towards more of a security use case. And so we went from like SaaS spend optimization to more of SaaS security. And that worked. Our whole journey, we raised out a little less than six million, about five and a half million. So we were on the venture path, but we didn't raise a ton of money. And we sold the company for 50. And so that was a pretty life changing event in early 2021. I had a lot of questions from Medine, Tax and Wealth to what I felt like existential identity purpose fulfillment. So your question, I was 29 years old, and I'm like, what do I do now? I had a handful of exited family, friends, and mentors helping me think through it all. That group, as you alluded to earlier, has grown in the last three years from these 12 friends and mentors to 2,500 post exit families from all over the world. So that's one of the things I do is, is kind of run that community. Done a lot of angel investing. Don't love investing. Happy to talk about that too. Um, it's not how I ended up as a partner at a venture fund. And then the main thing I'm trying to spend my time on is help exited founders build missionary companies. And you know, another topic I'm, I'm very happy to kind of dive into, what does missionary mean? Why exited founders? What does it mean to kind of co-build companies? One of the things I get really excited about whenever I'm in the community is whenever post-exit founders make a company together. I think that's really cool because they've gone through the different stages. They've gone through partnership disputes. They've gone through scaling challenges, investment challenges, and then they decided to form something. Post-exit founders might be making some baby companies, essentially, um, over the next several years. And that's kind of cool to see is that you created a space where some people are meeting their next co-founder, and, and that's that's pretty cool. But missionary sounds different. What do you mean by missionary companies? Yeah. So firstly, just comment back on the first piece. I'm actually curious to get your thoughts on this. Uh, there's an exited founder from the community who I was, he told me he was starting something new. I was like, oh, what are you up to? And he was sharing it with me. Um, and I noticed that his co-founder was also posting the founder community. I'm like, oh, did you meet her through PEF? And he was like, oh yeah, I did. Thank you. And I don't know if I should be <laughs> Yeah. Look I at think that. it's ultimate compliment that you didn't even realize like you built such a close friendship relationship over time. I didn't even realize that that's where you met or that we have a, you know, a value packaging kind of uh, challenge there. Honestly, that's amazing. It's like you, when you introduce the bride and the groom and you're at the wedding and you're like, oh yeah, I helped with this. This was great. In, in some cultures, they get a watch for introducing. I'm just, I'm just here, you know, in the background. <laughs> Well, actually, we were talking about getting a watch for post exit founders, so maybe you can get a like kind of like a co founder match. Like, hey, thanks for this, I I appreciate it. I would imagine that the success rate would be higher. It might require a pivot or two. Like at Intello, I think you had on your LinkedIn where you were you were saying that you were helping save those expenses, and then you were mentioning that switch to security. There might be some pivots along the way, but success hopefully is is more likely with the, this group. Um, you were asking about missionary companies. You know this firsthand. But like building a company is one of the hardest things we can do. It's a thankless job until maybe you get the, I know you've spoken about sending trophies to exit founders. It's like the thankless job until maybe, you, you know, <laughs> you, you reach the pot of gold at the end. But, and unless you build a company, it's hard to really understand what it means like in terms of the sacrifice. And so when you think of the exit founder persona, specifically the post-economic exit founder persona, who had a very meaningful financial windfall, the idea or decision to start another company is not just irrational, it's crazy. I don't think anyone outside of the actual founder person 
to be the one to say, here's the problem that you should devote, you know, the next 10 years of your life to that will take you away from your family, even though you don't need to be making more money. Just generally, I believe this, but even more so at the exit founder persona, missionary is completely subjective. I think missionary companies can look different. I could solve a whole range of problems, but it's more authentically being a missionary about the problem you're solving and excited to go solve that problem every day versus being a mercenary, which is what I was with Intello, which is not you know my life's work or, or passion, but it got me into a fortunate position. I think you brought up a good point around post-economic. Like you take the pressure off of, I need money for X, Y, or Z, or I want to make it in the eyes of my family and my friends. You've, you've kind of checked off that box and then something else needs to drive you. So it's curiosity or it's a passion or it's a, a goal that you want to accomplish. Do you have some examples of either some post-exit founders or some investments that you made that you think are some pretty good kind of mission-oriented companies? I will give an example of a, of a company I invested in, and then I will also give an example of um, one that we tried to build but didn't get there. So in terms of the one that I invested in, now, I think they are relatively stealth. So I'm going to avoid saying the actual name, but I'll, I'll give you the profile. Um, so there is a, a really awesome founder who built a multi-billion dollar health, tech-enabled healthcare company. It's still around today. This founder is still secondary over time. And he decided to step away from the business. He was one of four, one of four co-founders. And his, he was really passionate about becoming a teacher. His real goal was to be a high school math teacher. And he was like, all right, I built a multi-billion dollar company. That's amazing. I want to go be a high school math teacher. Yeah, it's wild. So he, he, he basically started you know applying to different schools. It was the middle of the school year. And so the only um, school he can get was in a, a pretty bad area in New York. And they gave him fifth grade math. And he did that for six months. And then it turned out that he hated it. And he hated it because, oh, no. one, there was no flexibility in the day-to-day. His colleagues were pretty miserable at work. He was actually scared for his physical safety when he was driving to the school. And he felt that he was like a glorified babysitter for the fifth grade because like it, it was more about just trying to get them to listen to anything versus the actual teach them. And he kind of realized like maybe my mission is not to be a teacher even though I thought that that was my aspiration. And he now started a new company that – uh, it was born out of the experiences of what he saw in that school, where he worked with a lot of kids that came from families below the poverty line. And he's now uh, created a virtual first therapy platform for uh, pediatrics for kids that come from, from Medicaid families. So Medicaid covers mental health for kids, but there is a shortage of therapists and access. And so he's working with social workers within the school to provide care for these kids in a for-profit venture back pursuit. That's an example of a missionary company. That's very unique. I mentioned also another kind of example, exited founder, nine-figure exit in the, in, the, in the healthcare space, was a CTO last time, decided wants to start something new, but wants to be the CEO next time. And we spent, um, I, we, uh, my partner and I, Shalom, spent a month with this founder. I don't want to share his, his, his name on the podcast. Trying to understand what he really cared about. And despite, you know, he built a mission here in company. It was, it was, like, it was a, objectively a, an amazing mission and had, you know, uh, a nine-figure exit from, from the business. But his real passion was food and agriculture. When he went home at night, he was watching videos of farmers for fun on YouTube and how they manage their crops. And he had a greenhouse in his backyard that he would kind of tinker with. And he cooks all the meals for his kids. And it became very obvious. That's that, amazing. Like, his real passion, which I think often can tie to mission, was food and agriculture. And we, we, we spent a bunch of time trying to find the right big ambitious pursuit within the food and agriculture space and kind of both uh, tie the passions with the interest. That to me is also missionary. Brock, what's your mission as far as like if you were to be a missionary founder, what, what place do you think you'll, you would find yourself in? It's very meta, but helping people find their missions. We spoke about this a little bit, concept of the idea maze, which was, uh, I think it was uh, Bill Aji in a, in a uh, lecture he did for Stanford maybe a little over 10 years ago that where, where that concept of the idea maze was, was coined. And what it refers to is founders that are kind of going through ideation, zooming out to see what are all the permutations and challenges and trap doors of like what can happen with this pursuit, with this idea. My own mm -hmm. goal in life in terms of uh, how I think I can make my biggest impact on this world is helping 
these incredible humans, mostly founders, find their mission. And in order to do that, we need to somehow be able to turn that idea maze, that ideation, from an art into a science. I don't know anyone in the world has really figured out how to do ideation in a great way. Now, I'm open to hearing if you know someone who you think is cracking yeah. code, but I think the code can be cracked. I just think it takes time and thought. Essentially like a, a framework for guiding you to your next thing. Is that what you're thinking? More or less. There's this idea that like companies are built because of that that you know lightning that uh, spark uh, uh, yeah <laughs> the, the the that moment where like this vision kind of came to you of like oh i can go build that company and that rarely happens they make it like a like a rom-com like you get struck by lightning yeah. you know and you're like oh that's the one you know um yeah. like a we crashed kind of moment or some of these other hbo shows that come up <laughs> but you you don't yeah. think that's the case and, I, I know it's not the case. I have met, you know, a couple of thousand exit the founders one and, and many other founders outside of that. But like, um, I, I, I think it's good, but like to get real for a second, it's just not how great businesses are built. And if you look at who's like the best in the world at ideation, I, I'll turn it up to the question. Who do you think is the best in the world at ideation? If we're talking popular names, like Elon Musk probably is the, the number one guy that people are talking about right now. Sam Altman. Actually, let's let's use Sam for an example. If you look at him, Sam's framework, or actually how he comes up with the idea, he's also mm -hmm. part of starting a lot of other companies that he has run. But the way that he does that is he fast forwards to live in the future. What does a future state look like in 10, 30, 50 years? And he builds off of a, a pretty crazy premise that we will have AGI. And in the world of AGI, what are the challenges? And there's energy, hence try to start a nuclear energy company. There is, you know, actually getting to AGI, hence uh, <laughs> uh, open AI, right? There's WorldCoin, which is like what happens to jobs and to, you know, how we kind of move money around the world. I think Elon Musk works similarly. And it's not this lightning in a bottle. It's like trying to build the future that you think society will be moving to. And I think that there, there are a lot of opportunities, as we know, seeing the amount of founders, you know, exit the founders in the world. And so find a problem that you will kind of persevere no matter what, but don't just like say, I want to build a career in food and agriculture and run after it. Take the time to be really thoughtful, like the rocket analogy around like knowing what might go wrong, knowing everything about the competitive set, knowing the, you know, every, every company that's, that's made an attempt to build here and get really good at it. I don't, you know, the creativity plays a role, but I don't think that's the main quality that you need actually. If we're talking about like a framework for how these propagate, right? The challenge and the problem, especially whenever you're talking about like on a macro scale, like what you're talking about is, is really good for like a billion dollar company and working backwards. It's like, how did they get so big? How did they get so large? Their problem was so large. But whenever you're looking at like almost like a smaller scale and also a lot of the people in the group, some of it is tied to oh, I think that's interesting. I have curiosity around this topic. And then like a little bit of serendipity, like what type of unfair advantage do I have around this? And what type of people do I want to do this business with? And that last part, is, I think, is probably the most interesting is that with this next stage, I want to do stuff with really cool people that I enjoy working with day to day, you know, like which is a little bit of a luxury. You don't always get to pick that. And sometimes these really cool people also want to solve these really big problems and they also want to spend their day you know, even if they're post-economics trying to figure it out. So I'm very curious about what this framework is going to look like, Brock, whenever you're done with it. I think you actually have a base of it because you break down the three different segments of what a post-exit founder does after, right? You have like these three yep. different segments, which maybe you can share. And then the question is, is like, what type of behaviors do each of those three different segments do? Like what happens next? And then which has the best outcome? Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll leave it to you to share the three different categories of post-exit founders. So in terms of framework for, you know, building missionary companies, building large missionary companies, now I'll come back to you in a couple of years. Like that, that's, that's the act of kind of failing yeah. by trying and hopefully succeeding at every once in a while by trying, like, I don't have all the answers, but I'm figuring it out. But for those kind of listening who are curious about that topic, we've had Mike Meeples come to the PDF community a couple of times. I know kind of if you, you joined either of the sessions, but he wrote a book called Pattern, yeah. uh, Pattern Breakers or Pattern Breaking Companies. I think it's called Pattern Breakers recently, which is a great read on a hypothesis of a framework, which is really like 
identifying an inflection is the most important point. And what is your unique insight or uh, as a friend put it to me recently, earned insight? What is your earned insight in that market based off that inflection? And then comes the idea which, which comes from living in the future. So that's like a high level maybe framework on ideation that um, I think is a useful tool that, that can work. I like this book and I'm, I'm pulling it up on the screen here so so we can look at it. But one of the fun things is I pitched to Mike Maples, my first company when I was like in college. We went out and had dinner and he asked me some of these questions and then he wrote this in like the book and I'm like, oh, ouch. <laughs> like this is this is perfectly <laughs> fair, you know? And so like whenever he was in Post Exit Founders, I was like, oh, this is full circle. 10 years ago, I was pitching Mike on Delegate it at the time and it didn't work out. And he was asking some of these questions. So he broke it down to, I think he said, well, three different points, but he was talking about pattern breaking ideas, pattern breaking actions, and then no limits, how to break through like how you think and how you act. So you're saying that like, we don't know what this framework is going to be, but maybe in a couple of years we can build on some of these ideas. We can invite more yeah. people as guest speakers. We'll, we'll crack yeah. the code essentially. I'm just a student, a student learning at the moment from people like Mike and people uh, uh, that are kind of way more experienced than me, but I'll come back to you. I think you, you brought up the post exit founder persona, which is the persona and the humans that I probably spend the most time with outside of my family at the moment. And I found that uh, exited founders have tend to have very similar paths. They sell their company and they almost always enter phase one, the messy middle phase. Now, the messy middle phase might include the rest and best phase where you need to be at the choir for a while. Maybe then you leave, you spend time with family, take a sabbatical, take time off, try to figure, you know, do some introspection. And then you're like, okay, now what? Right? Like, I, I'm looking for more fulfillment and something to focus on in my life. And not everyone, but I'd say the majority decide to start another company. And when they do, they have a bunch of different ideas and they start killing them one by one because they don't work. It's hard to get that conviction. And then they get frustrated. Actually, I find that most founders, it's the frustration that brings them back to whatever market that they operate in because they're like, oh, I have founder market fit. I know who to hire, et cetera. And so I think that that is a very, very common cycle that I've seen in that messy middle. Now also some are like, I don't want to start a company now. What do I do, et cetera. I'm happy to answer questions on it. Just quickly to kind of round out what are those other kind of like archetypes yeah. of exit founders or stages. The, there's the next mounted, you know, phase B, which is, okay, I figured out the company yeah. I want to start, or I figured out I want to start a venture fund, or I want to start a community, or, you know, a program or a nonprofit, but like, you know what you're building. And then there's a third persona. Uh, I'd say like phase A, the messy metal leads into that phase B, or phase C, it's like, I'm done. Get me off this treadmill. I want to just run my family office. I want to retire. I want to spend time with family. And there's there's a a, a growing community of folks that I've that I've been fortunate to meet who think a lot about that yet still want the fulfillment in life without you know uh, getting go, going back into the rat race. I do feel like there's a certain amount of anxiety. I don't know how many employees like some of these founders have whenever they exit, but it goes from having like a hundred or a thousand plus employees that are like accounting on you, right? Until you sell the business and then suddenly you don't have any meetings on your calendar and then you're figuring out like, well, what do I want to do next? And so a lot of the post-exit founders I talk to are like, how do I fill that time? How do I share what I'm working on whenever I meet someone at a dinner party? There's a little bit of anxiety around that piece as well as like, that curiosity and some of those other things that drive them. And I think this is talking a little bit more around like that messy middle and a little bit of like that next mountain kind of phase of what's that driving force. And I really respect the people that take a year off, you know, because essentially they're kind of quieting that voice in their head and being very intentional about what they do next. Like hearing those stories of I floated a river for 10 months. <laughs> like I want to hear more of those stories of Camino de Santiago, kind of like doing the hike and the pilgrimage to kind of figure out what you want to do. I heard of someone, I don't know this person personally, who worked in an Amazon fulfillment center after selling his second company because he really wanted to just work with other people and for no one to know where he was while, and he found that that was like um, uh, an outlet for him to be able to kind of respect while working. Uh, and so really interesting things that people do in that 
sabbatical. Hey, podcast listeners. This is Nate from the Made It Podcast. Wanted to reach out to any uh, founders, growth marketers, sales leaders listening. We've made a community just for you, and we want to invite you to join. We have growth playbooks for you to use, instructional events a few dozen every month to learn how to use the latest technology, uh, even some free services that can be helpful to help your company grow. The first thousand people to join are free. We've created a link. You can click on it in the bio for this episode. We hope to join us over at our community. Barack, did you take a sabbatical? Did you take some time off? And did you feel any amount of anxiety or what was what was that for you? I guess in a way, my story is, is a little bit like confusing because I don't really know what to um, refer to with this post exit founder community. Like right now it's not a business. It's kind of just like this community, but I did take two years off or almost two years, a year and a half off before, you know, having any sort of like commitments or income. So like in that one and a half years, I didn't, um, I had two young kids. And so, uh, didn't really have the opportunity to travel, but I didn't move to a new country. I moved to uh, Tel Aviv right, right when I left the acquirer, which was part of that, that adventure. I just was going through my introspection while meeting five to six exit and founders a day because of the growth of the post exit founder community and doing onboarding calls with most, at one point all, but now, yeah, most folks. It enabled me to do a lot more thoughtful introspection because I was able to learn from so many people that either went through it or were going through it. And I do feel a immense clarity for how I want to spend my time coming out of that. The post exit founder community, how did it start? Did you just make a type form and you started inviting people to uh, a WhatsApp group? Like how did, what was the original start? Yeah, there were 12, you know, mentors and friends of mine that were helping me. And I was like, li- I was literally calling or texting them about yeah, I mean, anything from like, do you have a wealth manager to I have a boss for the first time in a long time. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't remember what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> to have somebody to report to. <laughs> oh, what am I supposed to be doing here? What is it like to be at a big quarterly company? reviews? Like, yeah, there's just like a lot of like strange questions. And so I literally just messaged all 12 of them. And I said, Do you want to meet a handful of other exited founder friends that are, are kind of helping me? And they all said, Yes. So I put them in a signal group because in that initial cohort, as it started to grow, I realized like, I don't know this person that's being referred. And so probably when we we're like 50 people, I set up a type form and also just like in the founder mindset kind of way, try to figure out how to how to operationalize the scale without it becoming too cumbersome. Even though there's no website, you can't find this anywhere. <laughs> um, some of that might change soon, but even, even, even though that's the case, uh, I think having an invite only community where the only way to find out about it is someone refers you to it helped enable growing. We grew pretty fast, but in a thoughtful way. Like it's not like this has been shared on social media sites or even if you listen to this podcast, you probably don't know how to get access. You'll probably have to figure out how to reach out to Connor or myself in order to get, get, get the link. And that's purposeful. It's by design um, because we really do want it to be a yeah. vetted, trusted group of folks that can support each other. I'm a little curious about how you think that's going to change whenever it crosses over 3,000 people. And like how the group dynamics might be shifting. It's harder to be intentional. It's harder to vet everyone as they come in. You were telling me that you were up at like 2 a.m. or something like that in the morning, like, um, and you're you're working some pretty long hours. So, how do you think the group is going to kind of like uh, advance or change over the years? I think it's already changed. I don't know, like 3,000 is the number versus 2,000 or even 20,000. Um, and so, there, there right. became a question like, do you just cap it? Like, when we decided to move off of Signal to Discord, like, Signal caps you at a thousand. It's like there was a question like maybe we just keep it at a thousand and nobody else can get it until somebody rotates out and we have some, you know, level of engagement expectations. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of think about it. I'm a believer in Dunbar's number, which basically states like you can kind of hold any human can hold about 150 relationships um, in a real way. And I think that it applies mostly to communities. So when you kind of get over the 150 mark, uh, you start to not know everyone. And even if you didn't really know them when you were 100, but like you recognized Connor's name when he was sharing in, you've already looked him up and kind of know who, who he is and why he's sharing what he's sharing. And uh, one of the solutions we kind of had for that is what you were describing, like how do you create like affinity and geography-based smaller subgroups? So you still have the smaller group while having the, the benefit of scale with a larger one to get um, a wide array of answers, network connections, that resources that can kind of help you 
with whatever challenge uh, you're encountering at the moment in life or at work or anything else. My answer has evolved to believing that online communities cannot scale. I actually don't think that the subgroup answer is a great answer to this. It helps. I think YPO is a good model that kind of shows like really strong chapter leads and geo base uh, while still benefiting from, from a larger one. But ultimately, the other thing that YPO has, which which I think uh, is actually the most critical part, is offline interactions. Like especially in kind of COVID times, we all got used to like remote, virtual relationships, online communities, forums. Um, but to build real relationships with folks that can help you get real insights into how to be the best version of yourself or how to live your best life, the only way that can really happen is through serendipitous meetings. When you go into a meeting with someone with an intentionality, like I want to talk to Barack or I want yeah. to talk to Connor about X, Y, Z, like it's hard to get deep. But when you're just sitting there like over drinks or at a conference or you know, at a local meetup or a session of ideating founders or founders becoming emerging managers or whatever it is, like you can kind of just say, hey, I'm Barack. Who are you? How'd you get here? How do you spend your time? And, and just see what where those relationships lead to. And I think that's the most powerful part of communities. And I think what online platforms enable you to do is to scale that globally so that people can kind of meet each other across diverse backgrounds and ranges and geos and interests. And that's what I view as our goal. How do we enable this community to scale to get all those benefits from the network, but get people closer together that can support each other. How are you going to do that at scale, Brock? Do you have any plans on uh, this kind of like chapter setup? Yeah, we have sourced two kind of co-leads for 14 of the major cities where we already have a meaningful group of members. Uh, they have committed to help organize one event a month. That event can be a dinner at their house. It can be a hundred plus person kind of party uh, with stuff for kids and for the parents. It could be anything that they want it to be. We're just committing to some regular cadence. They've also kind of committed to getting to know the local members at a more personal level to figure out how to support, but also connect or to tap us. If from a global PF perspective, we can support folks. And so uh, some, some other kind of things that the local chapter leads are going to do, but that, that's, that's a big part and, and it's all volunteer based and they're, they're just awesome humans that um, want to give back. And generally, we just want to have a regular cadence of, of folks who kind of do that. We have a different hypothesis that of what we're going to try. So you mentioned this stage of YPO, some of these other mastermind communities uh, or communities that have mastermind groups, right? So for those not familiar, they're often structured around this smaller six to eight circle, pod, they all call it different things that you kind of connect with and meet regularly. I think that's great. I think it serves an important purpose. I also think sometimes you just have a sprint around something you need support with. So it could be like that navigating the idea maze. Like I have an idea and I want to validate. Like who are another six exited founders that we can create an accountability kind of program to do a three-month sprint. That's what we're hoping to start facilitating. Yeah. It's going to require more work. So uh, and more than just me and, you know, my partner, Shomo, doing it part-time on the side and staying up until 2 a.m. Trying to get to a level. So we'll see what happens. Rock, I wanted to ask you about some of your investments. Do you have any investments that you're, like, super excited about and super uh, jazzed about? You have over, uh, I think, 50 different investments in different areas. <laughs> yeah, I regret angel investing as, like, a side topic in case anyone <laughs> thinks about it. I, I love supporting founders. I'm kind of addicted to supporting founders especially one to build a missionary company. So I, I, yeah, I literally just committed to investing yesterday, even though I'm saying out loud how I don't really enjoy angel investing. Um, the why behind <laughs> not enjoying angel investing is just like not a lot of fulfillment from it, but the really the main thing is the job of investing is saying no 95, if not 99% of the time. And it's not so much the act mm. of saying no that is hard. It's how it changes me to be in the mindset of just rejecting yeah. people building their life's purpose. <laughs> uh, you know, I do that a few times a day. And I, I also just began to become a pessimist, even though I identify as an optimist. Right? I began to just look for all the reasons that this probably won't work instead of thinking about, oh, Connor, like, I love your fucking idea, man. Like, let's go figure out how to like conquer the world and make this happen. You 
invested in a soccer team with Gary V and a bunch <laughs> of other guys. Can you tell me about this soccer team that you tried to launch? It's very Ryan Reynolds. It's very much like uh, Ted Lasso. Like we're going to kind of yeah. take this team that's in this division and move them up to the Premier League. Yeah, I would love to hear about it and, and how you got into this because uh, we're yeah. all going to make it is a fantastic kind of slogan. <laughs> yeah, was, sports teams are hard. It's punchline, but um uh, yeah, let me share a little bit about that, and then I'll also tell you about a, a more machinery company that is doing really well that I'm excited about. So the team is is Crawley Town. Uh, the parent company is called Wag Me. We're all going to make it. Uh, this was a 2021, you know, vintage uh, sort of investment decision. I, I had a handshake agreement to buy a Israeli professional basketball team for free if could commit to invest an additional. $1 million a year on player salaries. So a complicated backstory to the basketball team, but it's one of the bigger ones within Israel. And I was like, oh, I can be yeah. like mini Mark Cuban. I'm 29 years old. This is like a dream. <laughs> I'm like a big basketball fan. Like, That's amazing. Uh, and so I was like, yeah. well, I don't think it's a good decision a few months after exiting to commit to burning a million dollars a year on player salaries unless there's a revenue model here. So I began to kind of work backwards, not the way you should do idea base, but work backwards to, okay, I can buy this basketball team and just got to figure out a way to you know, fund it for a million dollars a year. And I spoke to some big corporates and investment firms that maybe they wanted to kind of sponsor the team. That was the initial idea. And then I had kind of like this crazy idea. I'm not a crypto guy. I, I don't really own much you know, crypto, but I, start, I saw what was kind of going on in the world again. This is like late 2021. And I began to think, like, how do you turn a local team into a global team? How do you take this Israel-based basketball team and turn it into, you know, a, a team that the world would be interested the Lakers. in and, and kind of care about? And the idea I had was to, you know, democratize ownership and decision-making to the world stage and to make it something that people do want to tune into. And it turns out, by the way, you could buy the streaming rights for the entire Israeli basketball league for, like, nothing. Uh, I don't want to share too many <laughs> numbers, but like for nothing. Make make a long story short. Uh, I just needed to get people to want to pay for streaming rights, and and so I had this idea to to kind of leverage crypto to create your own coin to be able to do it. And I was talking to a few friends, and a friend connected me to this guy Evan Smith, who was working on a very similar idea, but for EFL soccer. And he kind of walked me through specifically the, at a very basic level, like. In EFL, you can get promoted and actually make money if you're successful uh, as you do that. And in Israeli right, basketball, yeah. you're kind of stuck for a bunch of reasons. Um, and so uh, I was like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing with this Israeli basketball team. This is probably a mistake. I'm literally just moving to Israel. So let me just invest in this, you know, in this opportunity, which Evan kind of opened up for me, and then kind of see what, what comes from there. And a bunch of us from Coastal Founders did. That's also been filled with a lot of learnings. Uh, some of that has played out online and i'm sure some of you have heard the story of crawley town and, and wag me to make a long story short like the plan was to get promoted in the second year of the investing crawley town got promoted their rivals were rexham and rexham the that, that whole ryan reynolds thing actually came after us they bought a team one league below us where crawley was they got promoted they were in the same league as crawley and then both got promoted together this past year but ryan reynolds is making bank with Rexham, Crawley is still burning a lot of money because he was able to tap into the global audience and some of the crypto ideas because of the macro environment never played out. So that's a long answer, but I, hopefully it's interesting. I think this is this is really fun, but also the Crawley Town FC, like the fact that it actually went up a division, I think is pretty cool. And I feel like there could have been a play where you're like getting in like a Twitter fight with Ryan Reynolds or something like that, where you just continue to like create this beef that maybe isn't there. You know, as you guys are both trying to advance. So, what's happening with the team now, Brock? Do you know? Yeah, so they're 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 you know battling it out in EFL one. Um, it's the the business side of it is really kind of the challenge. Like teams are expensive uh, to operate to yeah. run, and even when you get promoted, until you really kind of get into like the the Premier League or Champions League, like you, you got to always reinvest back into the team. To be able to be competitive and kind of make it and yeah. so it's not like these are like profiting regime and so like you make your money mo mostly from building long-term equity but that's why most teams are run by like billionaires because they could just fund it and they can uh, make the, the revenue model yeah. kind of like yeah didn't, didn't play out as well and so Crowley kind of like the first year spent a lot 
and didn't get promoted and kind of like actually almost got relegated. The second year, kind of like scrappy team and, and did get promoted. And now we're kind of like the scrappy team in, in the next level. So we'll see. Tried to do things like documentaries and stuff from like, to get more attention, but, but the team's doing well. Hey, podcast listeners. If you guys are interested in cold email outbound outreach that actually works or thought leadership and how to build a community around some of the things that you're working on, I highly recommend incendiumstrategies.com. They're not just sponsoring this podcast, but they're also helping us with a lot of the communities that we run on the back end. Uh, so if that's something that resonates with you guys and you're interested in learning more, check out incendiumstrategies.com. Thank you guys. And back to the pod. Can I tell you maybe about a more missionary company that's like, yeah, yeah. You know, Maybe less sure. viral, but but but, uh, but but worth noting. There's a company called Give Butter. Max Freeman, who lives in Austin, you might you might even know Max. Give Butter is a operating system for nonprofits, and they focus primarily on the nine of the ten nonprofits in the U.S. that have less than ten employees. Okay, I think of this as like uh, maybe your local church, perhaps your you know uh, softball club, your college you know uh, club. And they yeah. give all this software away for free, like email marketing, um, donation management, ability to do auctions, uh, direct mail, all of it's for free. And the way that they monetize is a percentage of donations. And they actually try to get the donor, the philanthropist to cover the cost for the nonprofit. Tremendous company, green mission, and they are like really, really growing fast. And so if you're looking for a job or you know, you're looking for how to manage your nonprofit, Check out Game Mother. I think there's something where, like, uh, when evaluating nonprofits, I kind of want to understand, like, what's the number of people that it's impacting? And then what's the severity of the issue that they're trying to solve? And then what's the impact of the dollar that you're putting in? And so if Give Butter ever goes into that area, that would be, I would be over the moon ecstatic. And, and I think it's pretty, pretty sweet. I have somebody else for you there. There's two PFers building a company together called Bono, B O N O that is planning to do exactly that okay. and actually more consumer oriented to try to enable almost like index investing into nonprofits purely from a data driven impact perspective. So we actually see metrics wise, how much each one of the nonprofits are supporting whatever cause you care about. Brock, one of the things I wanted to ask you is one of the missions for this podcast and for like the entrepreneur cooperative is I want to make more post exit founders. So I want more people to be able to exit their company and then have a better life after. How do you think that we can maybe make it easier for people to sell their business? We can't promise fulfillment, but we can at least facilitate a space for it. I think it's amazing what, what you're doing. And I think sometimes it's like sharing learnings, taking this knowledge that exists up here and kind of giving it back with podcast forums, interviews, sessions, the serendipitous connections with other founders is sometimes what leads to success. I've heard countless stories where Companies exits or it's just uh, happenstance met the right person at the right time who made the right yeah. connection. And that's kind of crazy. There's uh, I think you, you've met Todd who started a company called exit wise who are, you know, so he sold like four or five companies and he had that same kind of like Eureka moment around that, where it's just like, this is crazy that you have the most meaningful life event of your life. You spent years of your life building this company. And then some cold email from which is like what happened to us and some corp dev guy is what led to your company being acquired. And by the way, he only heard about it because his friend mentioned it to him at some conference. And it's like, yeah. that's just wild. And instead, if you can create intentionality around when do you want to sell? Why do you want to sell? What do you want your parameters of selling your company to be? Do you want to be at the acquirer? For how long do you want to be at the acquirer? Um, what is actually important to you, right? Because I think the headline number usually is not the most important factor. It's everything within that. You know, is it equity? Is it cash? How long do we need to stay? Um, what happens to your employees? There's a lot of things that, 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 that other folks kind of care about. And so, you know, Todd is kind of doing work trying to like produce exits by partnering with the founders and bringing the right mentors involved and kind of doing it. But sometimes it's just a matter of getting founders together and trying to bridge that gap between exited founders and current founders. And I think that's where we're spending time with Ego. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what you do. I'll, I'll, I'm here to support you. It's crazy to me that like you can find so many different resources on like how do you build a logo and how do you build a like how do you pick your company name and and some of these like things. But the biggest moment where it's like actually going to count and you're actually building a future for you and your employees for this next stage. And there's not much like you go to bankers yeah. and brokers and then you trust them to guide you. But just imagining that if you could pair 
if I could pair Brock with someone else that's also selling inside SaaS security space, and you're like, I know the buyers and I understand the terms, or even if it's outside of your industry, but you're pairing them with post-exit founders to kind of help guide them along, I think that there's something there. Brock, I appreciate the chat. Where should people go to find you if they want to say hi or, or see what you're up to? Uh, LinkedIn is probably best. That's what I monitor. The most frequent of all the social media sites, and that's me. Thanks for having me. Good to have you, bro. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter.